afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Gregorian, President and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club. Welcome to today's exciting meeting. I especially want to welcome our DEC members. And if you're not a DEC member yet, please allow me 10 seconds to myth bust. There's no job application. There's no nomination process. There's no job level or salary requirement to become a DEC member. We're simply looking for people that want to build their networks with other DEC members and learn from thought leaders on our stage. You can sign up at econclub.org. As we get started, I would just ask you to silence your cell phones so we do not disturb today's program. And if you've been with us before, you know we always get started with the pledge and a prayer. So I would ask you to please stand and join me as we honor our country with the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is to my right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And kindly remain standing as our invocation today will be delivered by Reverend Don Wright, Pastor Emeritus, from First Presbyterian Church of Dearborn, and it is so good to see you again. Thank you. <laughs> Let us pray. God, we thank you for the food provided, fellowship enjoyed, and our distinguished guest. But today we find ourselves in a troubled nation and world, from sabers drawn in the Ukraine, Taiwan, or Hong Kong, to the misery of millions of refugees, or those infected with the strains of COVID. At home, our hearts break for the families at Oxford as innocent lives experience violence and death. Unlawfulness plagues our cities, God. We find ourselves immersed in pain, suffering, and the death of humankind. There is a loss of moral compass. As we search for meaning in the midst of chaos, there are flashes of hope in the clouds of despair. Faith offers us a way in which to cope through the cacophony of cries of fear and anger. As Dr. King noted, Faith adjourns assemblies of hopelessness and brings new light into the dark chambers of pessimism. For faith is not selfies or a me culture. Friends are not Facebook numbers. Community is not Pokemon Go, nor is there a meta -dies. Faith, hope, and love abide, and the greatest of these is love. So remind us to love mercy and walk humbly. In this holy season, we note our hearts remain big extending hope through aid to the hungry, displaced. Responsible voices seek to calm our anguish. From the halls of our great universities, staff, faculty, students engage in study and research to build our industries and nation. By helping students craft their talents, enabling them to harness answers to the myriad of issues we face, hope is engendered for our nation's future. Lord, help us to listen to the wisdom experienced leaders as we have today Dr. Stanley and his vision for MSU, empowering excellence, advancing equity, expanding impact. And Lord, heal our lions, unlock our tigers, lube our pistons, and give lift to the Red Wings. Amen. Please be seated and don't forget that Lions victory yesterday. Let's go. <laughs> All right, we love having high school and college students with us each meeting. Today was no exception. They're here courtesy of our generous corporate sponsors, and their morning already began with a private student-only reception with President Sandley. Let me tell you who's with us. We've got students from Detroit Collegiate Prep, thanks to Adam Robbins and Accenture. Detroit Loyola High School, thanks Doug Farrick and the Children's Foundation and Schoolcraft College. Thank you to Linda Hubbard and Carhart. How about joining me in a round of applause to welcome students and thank their sponsors. A couple things on your table quickly. The season lineup first, you'll see a mix of in-person and virtual programs. Next up, if you're a young leader, We'll be at the Carhart Workshop in Midtown with DEC board member Linda Hubbard this Thursday, and I'll introduce her shortly, but I hope you have a ticket because that one is sold out. And to start off the new year, it's our always popular Michigan Economic Outlook meeting. That'll be held right here at the Motor City Casino on January 13th, where we will hear from new MEDC CEO Quentin Messer, 
and GM's chief economist, Elaine Buckberg. That will be in person. On January 20th, New York Times bestselling author Alec Ross will join us via Zoom to discuss his new book, The Raging 2020s. We look forward to seeing you. And as always, watch your email for more new meeting announcements. Also on your table is the sponsor brochure. Please, please take a minute to check that brochure out. We can never thank these organizations enough. We would not be here today if it wasn't for their generosity. So thank you to those sponsors. And the most fun I have up here is telling you about the DEC's incredible history of speakers that tell the history of our country. And President Stanley, December 6th is a very popular date in our 87 year history. You now join a distinguished list of 15 other speakers who graced our podium on this day, December 6th, with the first one in 1937, and I think maybe Paul W. interviewed him on the air. A few highlights. It, I'm not done picking on you yet, Paul W. Interestingly enough, in 1937, Senator Burton Wheeler visited the DEC to introduce Senate Resolution 294, the Wheeler Resolution, which implemented a 50,000 watt cap on AM radio stations. Okay, now I'm done picking on you, Paul W. Also, 1954, at the DEC, Frank Pace, General Dynamics, and his speech was titled The Coming Atomic Industrial War. 1965, U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff General McConnell, his speech was titled Lessons of Vietnam. And more recently, in 2013, right in this room, was Senator from Kentucky named Rand Paul. And today we're pleased to add you, President Stanley, as our 16th speaker on this day in DEC history. Congratulations and thanks for being with us. And finally, two ways for you to be involved in today's program. Number one, if you tweet, we encourage you to tweet using at Debt Economic Club. Number two, you can submit a question for President Stanley using your smartphone, and instructions are on your table. And those questions will make their way to our presiding officer, who I'm about to put to work. Linda Hubbard is the president and COO of Carhartt. She is a board member and great friend to the DEC and to me personally, and also a great supporter of many, many things in our community and state. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Linda Hubbard. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, DEC members and guests. It's my pleasure to introduce Samuel L. Stanley, Jr., MD, a distinguished biomedical researcher and university leader. He became Michigan State University's 21st president in August of 2019. In just over two years, Dr. Stanley has led many improvements to Michigan State's operations, services, and its accountability. Among his first actions was a realignment of MSU's three medical colleges and clinical services. That action proved to have great foresight as the university continues to safely confront the challenges of the global coronavirus pandemic and train the next generation of doctors and nurses as well as address health disparities in our communities. We've invited Dr. Stanley to share more on what MSU is doing to support student success discover, innovate, and address the world's great challenges from East Lansing to Detroit to across our state and around the world. Samuel Stanley is a leader in national higher education organizations and a dedicated advocate for Michigan State and all those the university serves. Our moderator today is certainly a familiar face to all. Paul W. Smith is the longtime morning host on News Talk 760 WJRAM. We truly appreciate all that he gives to our city and region, and we thank him for interviewing so many Detroit Economic Club speakers. So please join me in giving a warm Detroit Economic Club welcome to President Stanley and Paul W. Smith.
oh, now I see why the table's so high. Because <laughs> our stools are so high. That's good. That's good. At first, when I looked at it from down there, I thought, how am I going to reach that table? I am Paul W. Smith. Nice to be here. We are the voice of everything MSU at WJR, and proudly so. I know you hear the basketball games and the football games, but there are many a conversation with the good doctor that we have on my show because the academics are so very important as well. By the way, uh, Link Bessert is here from our radio station. You guys all know Link, and uh, happy to uh, have him here. And again, yeah. When Link and I would go on the road for the auto shows, which we did in Beijing and Shanghai and Paris and Geneva, and Frankfurt, we'd go around the world, it was pretty cool. Somebody once said to me, wait a minute, let me get this right. You go to all these auto shows and broadcast, I go, yeah, yeah. The cars are all the same each place you go, right? I went, shh. <laughs> so people would look at Link, he's a big fellow who played professional hockey, and they would automatically think he was my security guy. <laughs> because all the guys that came in from the auto companies had security guys, why didn't the talk show host? Well, I never have had a security guy, and, but Link, thanks for that role. And by the way, you did jump into action a couple of times and rescue me, but it was late at night and in an area that we don't want to talk about. So, I was just a guest in uh, President Stanley's uh, booth, suite, it's a better name for it, uh, for uh, an important football game, and I'm happy to say that even though I went to Michigan, people from Michigan State, all the leadership over the last many years have invited me to be up there, so I'm glad I'm still on that list. Um, it was not a comfortable place to be because I did go to Michigan, and of course it was the Michigan, Michigan State game, and they kicked our ass. <laughs> really, really. <laughs> Can't, I have to. I can't tell you what it's like to sit in the president booth, box, suite, while his team is kicking our butt. Early on, we were winning, and I couldn't cheer, because that would have been rude. So when we started getting beaten, it was a quiet cry that I was doing. <laughs> and everybody in the suite was going crazy. It was a lot of fun, and thank you for having me again and wait till next year. Anyway, <laughs> something I learned about uh, President Stanley that I, I found uh, interesting, he is, I'm not making this up, the first friend or business associate I've ever had who went to Harvard and has not yet brought it up to me. <laughs> I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but if you have any friends that went to Harvard, you know, you, you, you'll say, man, it's really cold out, and they'll go, well, you know, at Harvard, the wind really cuts through <laughs> and makes it even colder. He's not said a word, but let me tell you, he is a Harvard grad. He was trained in medicine at Harvard. He's a very bright guy. And with that thought in mind, my first question. You were called upon by the governor with some other very bright folks to help her during the pandemic. That's great. Is there anything you would have done differently than the governor did with your expertise? So what a, what a great question to start with. Um, <laughs> before, I, before I answer that, um, let me just give a shout out to Linda, uh, who's an MSU alum. Thank you so much, Linda, for introducing me. And thank you so much for everything you do to MSU. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> and then. And then I do have to do one more thing, and then I promise to answer the question, Paul. I'm, I'm not trying to dodge it. Sure. I'm just thinking here. Um, I did want to acknowledge the members of the Board of Trustees who are here today. Um, I really appreciate them taking their time. Um, Trustee Pat O'Keefe, Pat, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Trustee Kelly T. Bay. And Trustee Rima Vassar, thank you. They, they put in a tremendous amount of time for Michigan State. Uh, all of it, as I remind them probably too often, unpaid. So, so I really appreciate their efforts, and thank you for being here today. Um, this was a, has been a really challenging time, and COVID-19 turned out to be a virus that has behaved in ways I wouldn't have expected. So when I first heard about 
that there was a new SARS virus, and we call this based on SARS-CoV-1, which is the first virus in this family. When I heard there was a new outbreak in China, um, I thought it would go the same way the outbreak had gone previously, and that was eventually was contained by very standard public health measures, isolation, identifying cases, and then isolating people, and that actually stopped that outbreak. We had had another virus called the Mideast Respiratory Syndrome virus, which MERS, which had had several outbreaks as well, and each of those had been self-contained, basically. Um, there was no vaccine developed. There was no treatment developed, but they were self-contained. They were very lethal diseases. Each of them, the, the SARS-CoV-2 was about a 30 percent mortality. MERS is more like a 45 or 50 percent mortality. So I was concerned it would be this way, but I thought it would be easily contained. Clearly, I wasn't correct. And as the data came out of Wuhan more, uh, and we realized how contagious this virus was, much more contagious than SARS-CoV or MERS was, and how it had this really interesting phenomena that asymptomatic infection took place. So people could be not have any symptoms, not to put themselves at rest because they felt sick, but instead go out and about. That really in includes transmission as well. So all of this is to say that in the early phases of COVID, we were all operating kind of in the dark. And I think some of the actions that were taken made complete sense given what we knew of the virus at that time. And it's continued to evolve over time. So now I didn't think it, when we were speaking at this point in time that with the vaccine developed that we'd still be in the throes of yet uh, another surge in the pandemic. Um, this one related to Delta but with Omicron essentially in the background. And so this has been a very tough virus to deal with. So I think, you know, Paul, without, you know, completely dodging the question, I think everybody's been doing the best based on the kind of information we've had going forward. And I think the thing now is, and my advice to everybody would be, to continue to get vaccinated. I still think that's the thing we need to do with this outbreak is to get vaccinated, get your boosters, and I think that's probably the biggest main step we can have in trying to control this. And it's and, and I appreciate that that's from a doctor's point of view, not a political point of view. We got screwed up in this pandemic, in my opinion, because it became politicized in the beginning, and that's just run us off the rails, sadly. I, I note that you, Mr. President, have already come up for the requirements for the spring 2022 semester for Michigan State University. Can you sum that up? Sure. So we have been mandating vaccines for faculty, staff, and students at, at MSU. And um, it's really overall been met, I think, with, with success. And both in terms of the number of cases we're seeing on campus and in terms of people's willingness to do this. We have had exemptions that are available for all, and we probably granted out of about 60,000 people this applies to, we probably granted somewhere in the vicinity of 3,000 or more uh, ex exemptions um, for religious reasons or for medical reasons. And so we do have people who are unvaccinated. Those people enter into our early detection program, a regular testing program that we have on campus. And right now, everyone on campus has a mask requirement for indoors. And we're going to continue that as we start the semester. Remember when you think about colleges that we have a lot of people in congregate housing. So we have all these people in dormitories living together. And any virus spreads much better in those kind of situations, whether it's influence or anything else. So we really need to take extra precautions. And the other thing is our faculty really want to feel comfortable teaching. So they're the higher risk group in terms of age and mortality. So it's been very important for them that faculty, other faculty be vaccinated and that students be vaccinated. And they're very pro on mask wearing at this point in time. So we want to make sure we're doing that at this point. If numbers should change, and that would be wonderful, we take a look at these requirements. But right now, that's what we're doing. And we're complying with the orders that came from the federal government as far as faculty staff. The numbers on our campus, about 92% now of students are vaccinated, and about 98 to 99% of faculty uh, at MSU are vaccinated. Let's start at the beginning. Um, other than because they have a great basketball team and a great football team, why did you come to MSU a couple years ago? So, so those are actually components of it. Um, uh, I actually really enjoy college sports, and we'll talk more about it. And the chance to actually, you know, work with Tom Izzo um, seemed like an incredible <laughs> uh, opportunity. And we're really sincere about that. Um, but, but I think it was at this stage of my career, I was president of Stony Brook University for 10 years. Um, I wanted to go somewhere where I could have an impact and really make a difference. And impact to me in higher education is based about excellence, but also it's based about scope and scale. And Michigan has all three of those things. It has tremendous scope in terms of the kind of things we study, what we do, 17 colleges that are out there. So you can get a degree in essentially almost anything from Michigan State University. At the same time, our scale is significant, 50,000 students uh, overall. Extension, which takes us to all 83 counties in the state of Michigan. So our ability to do that is impressive. And then if you couple that with excellence, 
in the kind of programs we have, top-ranked college of education for decades now, still number one in the country, our business school Grove College with supply chain. We have this top nuclear physics program in the, in the country, uh, United States. And so that kind of excellence makes a difference as well. So if you put all those three things together, you're going to have an impact. So whether it's improving graduation rates for our students, whether it's doing work in research and innovation that can help change the world. We invented cisplatinum, for example, one of the most important cancer drugs. All these things can come forth from Michigan State University. And the chance to lead an institution that's doing that uh, is, was really exciting for me. And so those are really the main reasons. Dr. Stanley, do you ever see a time in the foreseeable future that college presidents can make as much as their coaches? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. That, was a dip that wasn't for I think you. I don't, that, I don't know where that I, came I, I from. I think I, I, I'm, I'm in favor of that. So just, just, <laughs> just, just, just to be on the record, um, I think that sounds pretty good. Um, yeah, it does, doesn't it? I think it's market, Paul. And you know, to, to, to put it, take a serious answer to it, it, it's really you know what the market says. I think that drives those things. Well, you guys said something very big with Coach Tucker, and other schools immediately had to respond. Well, I, I hope that wasn't the exact sequence, um, but kind of was. No, <laughs> and then now the next sequence is we have congressmen in Washington saying, "We've got to take a look at what's going on with these college coaches." Well, that's all we need is Congress involved in anything in our colleges. Uh, I think I think I think they were going to be, but but I think the the challenge is that. Football and all our sports um, are really something that unifies the campus in ways that very few things do. And it doesn't just unify the campus, but it unifies the campus with the community uh, around us and with our extraordinary community of alums. And I think the pride they take in success in sports is about being part of this MSU community. One of the things that really struck me the most when I came to Michigan State University was how much people cared about the institution. This sense of pride in the alums is really palpable. And as I've, I've told the high school students uh, earlier, um, the first time I went out with Michigan State gear and walked into a grocery store uh, in, in the New York area, and when I just, after I'd just taken the job, uh, and someone looked at me and said, go green. And luckily, I'd been coached by board members to say, go white <laughs> afterwards, or otherwise it was very embarrassing. And uh, anyway, that, that first time told me about that sense of community and pride. So athletics is a part of that. College athletics is a part of that. It also is a key opportunity um, for students. So we take a lot of high school students. Remember, very few are going to go pro. But a lot of them um, are able to go to college because they have a athletic scholarship. So it allows them to play, the sport they, play a sport they love, but the same way go to college as well. And that's really important. That has been the access to opportunity for many students, not just at Michigan State University, but others. So college sports has a lot of things to, uh, uh, I think, support it and to make us want to be involved in it. But you do have to do it right, and you have to put the student athlete at the center of what you're doing. Um, but great coaches like, Mich like Mel Tucker, I think, has had this incredible season this year, as you know, with a tremendous turnaround for our team. That's very difficult to do, as you know, in this environment. And I think that's an investment, I think, in the future uh, of football and athletics at Michigan State University, because football really drives the revenue for the other sports as well. Uh, Mr. President, you do have a, a growing relationship with Detroit and Southeast Michigan. How's that? How's that growing, going, and what's, what's your expectation? So I'm really excited about the work we're doing in, in Southeast Michigan. And, and when I arrived at MSU, this is something that the Board of Trustees really emphasized to me. They said Detroit is undergoing this renaissance. There's so much change that's taking place there. What's MSU doing to be a part of this? And how do we work to be more of a part of it going forward? So we right now have about 100 different programs uh, in Southeast Michigan um, that we're conducting. We have more than 500 faculty and staff who are involved in them. Those range from the branches of our extension program. So there's actually extension. People think of extension as being a rural agricultural program. But we have extension branches in Wayne County um, that are involved in helping. Um, we've actually set up downtown uh, gardens and, and agricultural plots, essentially, to help bring food and nutrition in food deserts um, to people of the city. At the same time, our College of Education, which I mentioned earlier is number one ranked in the, in the world, um, has been working with the Detroit Public Schools. So we're working with them to try and improve K through 12. I think we can do more in that. That's something I've talked a lot to our College of Education about, is how we can do more, because that's so key to us and our future, both us, meaning both Michigan State University and the state of Michigan. Um, but I think we're doing that as well. And then we have a couple of new programs that maybe we'll, we'll highlight, or if you want me to take them up now, I can, um, which is the Apple Development, Apple Developer Academy and our alliance with Henry Ford, which I think is going to help us. Great do new partnerships in Detroit. 
Exactly. So, so in the case of Apple, that's a partnership between Apple. I, we've all heard of them. I've got two of their phones sitting on the table here. Um, and at the same time, it also involves the rocket companies and uh, Dan and Jennifer Gilbert and their support. And the three of us have come together to create the first Apple Developer Academy uh, in, the, in the United States. So there's been one in Ireland. There's been one in Brazil. There's been one in Indonesia. Uh, maybe Australia too, but there's never been one, or Italy rather is the other place, but there hasn't been one in the United States um, before. And what this does is it's a way to take 18-year-olds and allow them first to go through a program uh, over a summer where they learn some of the basics of programming uh, and how you program for the iOS system uh, that Apple, Apple apps uh, are devised for. Uh, and it's open to anybody above 18. They open it up uh, and welcome people to come. And then if you get through that and things go well, then a number of them are selected for the full academy, which is one or two years. That's being housed now in the old First National Bank building uh, uh, in Detroit. Um, we have more, eventually we'll serve more than 1,000 students. We have 100 there right now going through the program. Um, they're working with faculty from MSU, not just in computer sciences, but faculty in business and in uh, communication arts. Because one of the ideas, your main project towards the end, is to actually come up with an app and present it, as you would if you were starting a new company or trying to sell this app um, to uh, an existing company. So all of that is built in. And I had a chance to visit there and meet with three of the people, uh, uh, three of the students there. One of them was the mother of six uh, children um, who was returning uh, to learn computer skills. She wanted to improve her life and those of her children by learning how to program. She also wanted to be able to talk computers with her kids because her kids were so much more tech savvy than she was. Uh, and then I met a Renaissance High School student from Detroit uh, who's 17 years old um, who's arranged all his courses so he can go to the Apple Developer Academy in the afternoon. He takes only morning courses, but arranged it so he can go to the Apple Developer Academy in the afternoon. And of course, I'm trying to recruit him to be an MSU student in the future, because um, that's very important. So I mentioned it to him that this would be a great follow-up, or kind of would be an enroll in MSU. Uh, and then the third person was someone who's had a career in tech, but hadn't actually worked in Apple apps, but wants to use it for the community. They see this as a way to develop apps that could help health uh, and well-being in their community, and that's a community within uh, the city of Detroit. And so I think these are the kind of programs that are exciting. The Henry Ford Alliance has been a great partnership. Wright Lassiter, the president and CEO of Henry Ford, has been a great partner with us putting it forward. And the idea is to really work together in all three aspects of what medical schools do, uh, what hospitals do, and what universities do, and that's research, uh, education, and clinical care. And so it's a widespread alliance. I don't want to spend all of the time on this, but it's going to allow us to really partner with Henry Ford as we partner with Spectrum, as we partner with Sparrow, as we partner with McLaren, to do more than the sum of our parts um, to really make a difference in health. And we'll be focused on Southeast Michigan. An eventual goal will be to have a satellite campus, both medical school and research, in Southeast Michigan on the Henry Ford campus. And that's what we're going to work towards. Very cool. This is your first visit to the Detroit Economic Club. It is. That's not too shabby. How many have been here a few times? How many of you have been asked to speak? <laughs> ben, you're not. You, ben Maybach. Okay, so he's been asked to speak. But Well, that's pretty cool. How did you feel about that when you got the call? Did you have any hesitation at all? Oh, none whatsoever. And particularly when I used, learned that you would be my... <laughs> my do, you would be I'm my, sure that's what closed it for you. you. You would be doing the Inquisition. I mean, interview. Um, no. <laughs> Friendly little fireside Exactly. Chat. No, I think it, it was uh, it was a no-brainer, um, and particularly, you know, Steve and I have talked about the club, and I think its importance to Detroit and the state of Michigan, really, how much it matters. And I think also just when you go through the list of the people who've appeared, it's every president since Richard Nixon. Um, so that's amazing, and I'm, I still um, am hoping to meet every president, um, and I haven't done that, so that would be wonderful. I've interviewed every president since... Gerald Ford. Wow. I have known the last president for 40 years. I interviewed him when he was running for president, but did not get a chance to interview him when he was president. And you have to really know Donald Trump to know how something like that would happen. <laughs> I'm going to avoid that. That's yeah, I just think it's yeah. probably a good idea because I haven't really sworn or done anything up here yet. So I, I don't want that to happen. Um, if somebody said to you on the street, what's new at MSU, what would you say? 
Oh, there's so many things. Um, one is we're really proud about our graduation rates. We've made a point of putting student success at the center of what we do. And so one of the biggest reads out of that is graduation rate. How many students come to Michigan State and graduate from Michigan State? There was a time in higher education when you measured success, excuse me, measured success on how many people you turned away from your college, right? How many people do we reject? That makes us elite. We've mm -hmm. changed that around and we said, how many people can we accept? But then when we accept them, we need to have them graduate. That's a critical goal. So we're up to over 82% now in our graduation Beautiful. Rates. That's a 0.8% from where it was last year. And they may not say much, but if you put humanity to it, it's about 148 uh, more students graduating from Michigan State this last year than would have graduated the year before based on the success rate we had on retaining them. So that's huge. That's huge for the state of Michigan. Those 140 plus individuals are going to 64% of them are going to stay in Michigan. They're going to make a million dollars a year above what they would have made as high school graduates. And they're going to pay taxes and vote and do all the important things we hope for them for our citizens. So it's a victory for us. And we're going to continue to push this. And it's about focusing on students, doing the things that are necessary to help them succeed. You know, we just went through, and uh, are still going through, what happened in Oxford. May we all remember them. And when we pray, include them in our prayers. Um, running a, a school at any level, you think of the responsibility you have to those kids, to their parents. And it sometimes, I would think, can be overwhelming. And then you have somebody who comes to visit the campus and they go missing. Is there anything new on the story of Brendan Santo? You know, Paul, I wish I could report that, that we had news on that. Um, it's been a, such a terrible tragedy um, for, for the Sando family, for the campus, and for all of us. And I think the goal right now is to work to recover Brendan, Brendan and bring him back home um, to his family. I think that's all of our goals. And I think we've done work with the FBI, a work with surrounding law enforcement. Um, we have really, I think, all indications point to what was a tragic accident probably involving the Red Cedar River that passes through our campus. And I think we have done and just recently completed a major sweep of that um, to try and identify and determine exactly what happened. Um, but I think, as you talked about, the safety of campus is paramount. When we discovered that one of our cameras had not been working right. uh, in front of the dormitory center, um, we took action, ordered new cameras essentially for the campus to add more. I don't think that would have changed the outcome of this at all. Mm -mm. But um, we really care about the safety of our students and families. And so it's very important for us that we try and create an environment of safety around the campus. It's changed. Being president of a university has changed dramatically from the first time you started doing this. I think it has. And I think, you know, you mentioned Oxford. And again, 300 of high school students from Oxford attend Michigan State University. So the counseling for them was an important component of us when this terrible tragedy happened. But also as a reminder to us that, you know, why we need a police force on campus and why we need a force that can respond to these kind of things in a very short amount of time. And that's something we've worked on and continued to reinforce while I've been there. Do you want to brag any more about uh, Spartan athletics or can we move on from that? I could do it all day. Um, I'm I, sure I you could. I, I think just, just pointing out Susie Merchants, our basketball coach, um, won her 300th game in MSU and her 500th game She's been uh, as a coach. That's just, yeah. Susie's been there forever. I know. He's done some great things, great things. And, uh, you know, and I, I will return for football just for a second. Um, uh, I w welcome everybody to join me at the Peach Bowl um, December 30th uh, against Pitt. It's going to be a really good game. They have a good team. It's uh, 7 p.m. Uh, on ESPN if you decide to stay home, but it'll be much more fun in Atlanta. So it, does, it, it, does it strike anyone else that it's the Peach Bowl and Pitt is one of the games? One of the, <laughs> Not until now. Has that struck anybody it, else no, than it, me? It took somebody as, as smart as you to figure that out. My, my, my angle has been that it's, it's the Chick-fil-A um, Peach Bowl, so both chicken and peaches will be prominently featured uh, in, in that bowl game. Well, it's exciting, that's for sure. It's I mean, look at, nobody thought either of our teams were going to do much of anything this season. And look at how far both of those teams have come. I think both of us were at the zero percentage point for chances of playing in the college football playoffs. And oh, yeah. Michigan has defied those odds. So. Yeah. yeah, really something. All right. You've been active in national higher education associations. This has been something that's, by the way, did you own that tie before you had this job? No, no, okay. I, All right. did not. I did not. Um, I, 
<laughs> I was can't, just can't see the future. Hey, no, no crystal <laughs> no, ball. I'm just yeah. wondering. I exactly. see the green and white. That's yeah. good. Um, uh, you're active in national higher education associations. Give us a glimpse uh, from your perspective, Doctor, uh, uh, the future of higher education. You know, we're getting a lot of different people weighing in on that. Well, well I think the, one of the things we, we learned, really two things we learned. So one was that online really can deliver quality education uh, in the environment. We were compelled to do it at the early stages of the pandemic, and so we really had faculty who had never considered doing that. Faculty tend to be relatively, uh, I don't want to see conservative, but, but you know, really reluctant maybe to try new things. Maybe that mean, means conservative, but really reluctant to try new things. And I've always said it's easier to change the course of history than a history course. Um, and, and, and I think that I think that's actually true. That's um, but we we really did ask our faculty to switch what they were doing on a, on a moment's notice and start teaching remotely. I think that expands opportunity. I think it expands opportunity for students of different of, uh, who are atypical students in terms of the background they bring, uh, and I think for our students who uh, are allows them to take more courses. We saw hours taken actually go up during the pandemic, so people were taking more course hours because of the convenience right. of online courses. I think they had opportunities to do that. So you saw more course hours. That helps students graduate faster. So I think we're going to see more online in the future than we've seen before. But at the same time, students absolutely wanted to be on campus. And so even at the beginning, if you remember, we went fully remote at, at U of M, at Michigan State, at other colleges. We still had students coming back to the vicinity around campus. They wanted to be with their co friends. They wanted to be around the college. They wanted to participate in activities if they were there. And so that's made us really rethink and really recommit to housing on campus and opportunities in housing on campus to improve student success. So I think that's, to me, kind of the paradox is, on the one hand, students want it more online. On the other hand, they really want to be on campus to get their education. Uh, no doubt about it. Yeah. I, I have a, a freshman. My daughter's a freshman in college, and uh, it was very hard to do what, what was being asked of them to do. The motivation, the missing of the being in a social setting. I, I can only imagine how much harder it was in high school and grade school, but in college even at that level. These fine folks are going to ask you some questions in just a moment because uh, Linda's going to come back up and go through those with you. Is there anything, I haven't asked you a lot of things, is there anything that you came here knowing that you wanted to say to this fine group of people that I haven't asked you about or led you into? No, I think you've been very comprehensive. I'll, I'll just say again. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good. I didn't Good. ask that question for you to say that. No, I, yeah. I just want you to have the opportunity because you may not get the question that was one that was on your mind before we got here. No, I think I've covered it. Yeah, no, I think we're ready. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready I, for the, I, I'm ready for the lightning round. I'm ready for questions from the audience. <laughs> just, just, just I think he's done a it. nice job and doing Thank a great you. job at Michigan State University. Thank you, Doctor. And uh, we're going to bring up uh, Linda Hubbard back up here and take care of those uh, those uh, lightning round questions. And I'm going to get out of the way so I don't sit here looking like I'm trying to give you answers. <laughs> <laughs> There's no chance of that. No, yeah, no. Just no. Kidding. Just kidding. If they give you a tough question. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul W. Thank you. Okay, so now the really tough questions come from the audience, President Stanley. So, no, th thank you for all, uh, to all of you that submitted questions. There were a lot, so I apologize in advance if we don't get through all of them. Um, but I'll start with the first. Uh, President Stanley, what was, uh, when you became president at MSU, what was the biggest surprise? I, I think I spoke at the beginning about scope and scale. I, I think until you actually get on campus, um, you don't realize the scope and scale of Michigan State University as a campus. It's 5,200 acres, uh, essentially. Early on, I walked kind of the non-farmland component of it with my wife, and I realized we'd traveled about 12 miles uh, during the day. We just went out for an afternoon walk, and you know, hours later, um, ended up at the ice cream at the dairy store um, for ice cream. Um, but but it's, it's really impressive. And then when you think about 
the far-flung locations. So you think about the work we're doing in Grand Rapids and the medical mile we've set up there, which is incredibly exciting, a public-private partnership, which is really improving the health of the people in western Michigan. Um, you look at what we're doing in Flint, um, where we've really changed that community and really helped children uh, have a much better start, taking what was that terrible crisis uh, with water and lead and turned it into something that's improving the health of the community as a whole. And I think it's really proven to be a very great partnership. So we went to that community and said, not we're here to help you, but rather, what is it you need? Tell us what it is you need, and then let's work together to help achieve it. And that's been kind of the principle for our partnership. So I look at that, I look at what we're doing and going to be doing in Southeast Michigan, and I think it really sets a standard for how we're going to proceed and move forward. So I think, you know, I've, the thing that surprised me the most, again, is just the total impact that Michigan State has on this state. Thank you. You referenced, um, uh, many times you've referenced this concept of creating a culture of lifelong learning. And what's Michigan State's role in that? Well, it's incredibly important. And I think one of the things, again, is, is philosophy changes for colleges. There was this notion that we hand you your degree and then it's, you know, goodbye, good luck. Um, and I think we really want to change that. And I think we want to provide opportunities because we know the way things are nowadays, that people change jobs, they want to change careers in mid-course. So how do we help facilitate that? How do we help support that? Both for the companies that they may be leaving or going to and for the students themselves. So I think that's an, our career services, I think, are becoming more and more important in terms of what we do. And I think that's where online comes in again because for those kind of students, online opportunities are really important. Um, the ability to not have to physically come to class, but rather to be able to take something particularly asynchronous uh, on your own schedule. So I think really increasing our opportunities there, really partnering with businesses to understand better what are the needs they need, what are the skills they need in our graduates, and then be willing to say that maybe we didn't get all of those in four years, but there's others we can get to um, through online or other mechanisms in the years ensuing um, to help them be productive and get choices in terms of what they want to do going forward. So kind of upskilling through this, I think, is really important. And so you just talked a little bit about online learning. So what happens to the physical campus, that whole concept? I think it, it stays and thrives. I, I think, you know, work, work remotely is going to change it to some degree. I think our administrative spaces, our back office spaces are going to shrink. Um, I think we're still thinking, as many of you are, probably have companies, how to do that most effectively and efficiently. And so I welcome, I look at this part of the audience because my chair is pointed here all the time, but I'll try to talk to you as well. Um, I think we're still doing work on that, but I think that's going to be important as well in terms of, but I think the campus itself stays, and we're investing in our physical plant. So we just built a new STEM building. Um, it's probably the state-of-the-art science, technology, engineering, mathematics classroom in the country. I say that without much fear of contraindication. It's the old power plant that was right in the middle of campus and near the stadium. We've converted that into a state-of-the-art STEM facility. Uh, at the same time, we've added to our music pavilion. Uh, the Billman Pavilion is added to our music college, um, a beautiful setting. If you haven't been to campus, you need to see the Minskoff Pavilion as part of our Brogue College, probably one of the nicest classroom settings and building settings, I think, in the country. So we're investing in our physical plant at the same time and our commitment. We're actually increasing the amount of time students will spend living on campus to a two-year requirement because we found that students living on two years are more likely to graduate than students who live on one year, particularly for underrepresented groups. So can I just say that our old tailgate spot was the old power plant lot, and, but we are more than happy to have given it up for that beautiful Thank stem you. building. Thank you for your so. sacrifice. <laughs> so um, as, just specifically about one of the buildings on campus that we're very famous for, the facility for rare isotope beams, how um, has that been progressing? Is it still set to open? And it's going great. Um, on budget, um, on schedule, maybe a little ahead of budget. Um, and the facility for isotope beams is this, this incredible partnership, essentially, between the federal government, Michigan State, and the state of Michigan um, to build a state-of-the-art facility that's really the next generation in nuclear physics uh, to look at the ability to generate isotopes, different kinds of isotopes. And isotopes turn out to be very important uh, in our ability to diagnose diseases, to uh, measure uh, rare elements, um, and incredibly important applications to this, but very basic science about how matter is uh, composed and basically what happens when stars collide, actually. Both of those will be studied there. All of this work is being done by colliding ions and doing it at very low temperatures, so condensed matter physics and nuclear physics, condensed matter physics. And this is going to attract, we already have 1,000 people, roughly 600 people signed up who want to use this facility, so it's a user facility. So people will come from around the world 
um, to East Lansing, Michigan to do their experiments and we will accommodate them there. Uh, our scientists will be using it uh, and it's going to be a way in which we can continue our leadership in nuclear physics and attract more students and graduate more students in that field. So it's a win-win. Economically, it has an impact probably, we estimate, of up to $4 billion on the state. It's already created thousands of jobs in the construction. So this is a great example of the state, the federal government, and the university partnering together to bring something like this that's fantastic to Michigan State. It's really like a national lab. So you've heard of Fermi National Lab or those labs. It's very much like this, except it's run a little differently, and it's right in the middle of our campus. So the pandemic has affected K through 12 education in, in our state as well as across the country. Has this influenced the credentials at all of how you evaluate incoming students or the freshman curriculum? So th that's been a huge challenge and uh, you know, that's, Ben asked me about that earlier and when we had a, and had a brief discussion in the other room. And I, I think there's, there's, one of the things that's happened is we have done this and that is we have changed the requirement away from standardized tests because of the stress of the uh, pandemic and the inability of people to get access to those tests early on in the pandemic or to have the kind of prep other students might have had, economically disadvantaged students didn't have access to the prep in their schools. So we've lifted the requirements for the SAT and ACT um, for MSU. The good news with that is we've seen no difference in the quality and success rate of the applicants we've had so far. So it's a very short experiment so far. We're only in a year, but as we look at retention rates, uh, we see good retention rates for all those students. So it doesn't seem to have an impact by giving that up. So I think that's one factor right there as we've gotten away from those standardized tests. Um, but in terms of changing curriculum, we have a number of programs that are designed, particularly for students that come out of economically disadvantaged areas where there's no AP courses and so on to help students kind of catch up. So we have some summer programs, the Made in Detroit um, program that we have, whereas mastering academics and developing uh, and uh, mastering academics and something education, um, I can't remember the D, um, but the MADE program is really, I think, a program where we provide summer opportunities for students to kind of get caught up in areas like, re like writing uh, or mathematics, areas may have, they may struggle with. So I think we have these kind of programs already. But we haven't introduced anything specifically new because of pandemic other than waiving that test requirement. So how do you personally connect with, with the students and the whole university community? So, so it's, 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 it's one of my favorite times, first of all, to have opportunities to interface with undergraduates, and it's one of the things I enjoy most. And so uh, I, I've set up student office hours um, so students can come in and talk about whatever they want to talk about. They each get 15 minutes, so it's not a lot of time, but I figured out if I did every student at Michigan State, um, it would take me a number of years, like decades or so on, to see everybody at Michigan State in a year. Um, even at 15 minutes a student, it takes a long time. Um, but those opportunities are great. Um, I think I do a number of student events, so ASMSU events, I do COGS events, our Council on Graduate Students events. Um, participating in things like participation, so this is where the students all get to go out on this huge outside area and identify, people set up uh, booths and they get to identify what activities they want to get engaged in. So every club on campus basically puts out something. So I go to participation as a chance to just walk around, introduce myself to students. I always have the same questions, you know, how did you find your way to Michigan State University? What are you studying? What year are you in? Um, you know, and then keep studying hard, you know, be, be safe. Um, those are the messages. Um, but it's wonderful for me because I think the most rewarding part of my job, obviously, uh, is being able to take people and help them reach their full potential. I have an incredible team that helps me do that incredible faculty, incredible staff, but ultimately, you know, we do this amazing research and innovation, which is so important to the state, but ultimately the students are really, uh, you know, the, the, the heart and soul of the university, the reason we exist, and helping them succeed, helping them participate in that great research, give them the experiential learning they need to succeed. All those things are incredibly rewarding, and getting to talk to them about their individual experiences is great. So I try and manufacture ways to do this, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I live right on campus, so I'm the first president in a number of years to live on Cole's house, so I'm right in the middle of campus. Don't come up and ring the doorbell if I'm not expecting you because I, I won't answer because I won't answer but um, and it, but I try and be open up to a certain point. So yeah. Can I just add that when President Stanley first came to campus and Cole's house was being renovated he actually lived in one of the graduate dorms. So this is a guy who was yeah. committed to being available. So. It's a wonderful chance to relive some of my comments. <laughs> yeah. Might, might have dampened the spirits a little bit on that floor from time to time. But. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think they were inhibited. Okay, last, uh, last audience question before the lightning round would be, how would you describe Michigan State University in one word? 
Oh, wow. Um, I think driven. Um, I think there's a sense of mission uh, at Michigan State University, a sense of changing um, the world, uh, essentially, that we have. And I think people are focused and committed to it and I think driven for success. And the Detroit analogy in the Motor City is not, not the reason I picked that word, but I think this is really a high level of commitment and I think driven to make a difference. As I look at the pandemic and I think of the extra hours people have put in, um, my team available, we had meetings Saturdays, Sundays, we were meeting on a regular basis to deal with this. Um, this is a group of people who cared about their mission and therefore were driven to success. So. Okay. So lightning round is really fun question. So um, I think don't hold uh, Dr. Stanley to any of the answers. It's, it's gonna be off the top of his head. So um, so your best sport when you were, you were a kid and, and today? Basketball as a kid, tennis today. What profession other, and you've had many different professions really leading up to university president, but what profession other than the current one you hold would you like to try? Law. Lawyer, I, 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 I'm an amateur lawyer for our general counsel. I'm always telling them, <laughs> always telling them what I think my opinion should be and how courts would rule, and it's invariably wrong. But I'd still like to try being a lawyer. Your first paying job? Lifeguard. If you don't count mowing lawns, I mean, I mowed lawns when I was 12 years old, but lifeguard is 16. Okay, you can trade places with someone for one day. Who would that be? Oh wow. James Harden, I think, um, the basketball player. If I could, if I could be <laughs> James Harden, I think that would be it. He's left-handed, he's a great shooter. That's what I'd like to be. Okay, um, if you were US president and could tackle one issue, what would that be? So, so my first response would be higher education, obviously, because I think it's so important, and, and so I'll, I'll just stick with it. Um, it would be higher education and ways in which we support students and student success. We need to do more in terms of Pell. We need to do more in terms of uh, education in K through 12 as well and get more teachers and more support for that. So I, I would like to help me back with that. So, so the, the Secretary of Education would be the job I'd want to have. So you get to pick any musician or band for a private concert in your backyard or in the back of Cowell's house. Who, who's that going to be? Oh, wow. Um, so if they were two of together, I would pick the Beatles. <laughs> question. Um, but that's not going to happen. I would say Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars is an interesting performer. And I think uh, I've heard him play live at Stony Brook, and he was pretty amazing. So Bruno Mars gave an amazing concert. Uh, tell us something on your bucket list. Oh, um, I'd like to, do um, you know those fly things where you have the fly things where you jump and like it's like you're skydiving but you're supported by air, what, is it, what are they called? Wingsuits. Wingsuits, yeah, maybe a wingsuit. Um, I'm not doing it anytime soon, so, but, uh, <laughs> but, but maybe when I have less years of potential life uh, to worry about, <laughs> I'll consider doing that, so. Okay, last, last lightning round question is, Advice to your 25-year-old self. Yeah. Um, you know, I, the, the, the flippant one would be to say buy stock in X company. Um, but I, I won't say that, although that would be the, the best advice I could have given. Um, I think everything I've done has, there were, there were no clear pathways to me um, going forward. So I think to continue to just say, get the most out of every experience you have. So take the most away from everything you can as you're doing it. So if you have a job as a lifeguard, take the most from being a lifeguard. Do, be the best lifeguard you can be. Um, if you're working in construction, and I worked construction before, be the best construction worker you can be. If you're being a university president, be the best you can be. If you do those things, good things generally happen if you make that commitment to whatever you're doing, that to be in that moment and do that job as well as you can, then I think good things happen to you over your career. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Stanley. I'm going to turn it back to Steve to close the meeting. Thank you, Linda. President Stanley, it is always a treat to have you here, and we look forward to doing it again sometime. Thanks for your support of the DEC. One last round of applause for President Stanley. <laughs> Linda Hubbard, Paul W., thanks for being with us. It's a treat, and your time and talents are always appreciated. Linda, we look forward to 
having you uh, speak to our young leaders this Thursday. So thank you to both of you guys. A couple quick thank yous to Sparty for being here with us today. That was great. Sparty, I believe. And I want to say thank you to Emily and Kathy from your team, President Stanley, and also to my team. So ladies and gentlemen, hope to see you at the next DEC meeting. It's the Michigan Economic Outlook meeting January 13th. Until then, have a terrific, safe, and healthy holiday on time. Every time this meeting of the Detroit Economic Club is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.